Welcome to the Twilight Zone, the zone where the unknown is made known with stories involving real people and real places. On Revelation TV, the finest. If you're searching for how to master and flow in the supernatural, this is a program for you. So, call anyone you know, especially the unbeliever, who wants to make sense of the supernatural to tune in right now, because tonight, we will start breaking things down. We are live and interactive on all the social media platforms. You can email us with your comments and questions. And my question to you now is, have you ever had any supernatural encounters that you would like to share with us on this program? If yes, kindly email us on live at revelationtv.com. Hello and welcome to the Twilight Zone, the zone where the unknown is made known with stories involving real people and real places. We have a real person for you tonight. And I have with me on the Twilight Zone, my dear sister, Sylvia. How are you? Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank God. Looking forward to a great program. We are looking forward to yes. a beautiful program. Uh, indeed. You know, um, and I think we've spread the word. We, you've shared it on all your all the social media platforms about yeah. tonight's uh, program. And it's so interesting because I was listening to Mel and Kett and they were discussing something similar, isn't this? They're talking beautiful? about heaven. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but heaven is for real. Yes. <laughs> so thank God. <laughs> and tonight we have a gentleman. <clears throat> he died. He had a heart attack, died, went to heaven, met God. He wanted to stay behind, but the Lord sent him back. And you know what? He's a very, very special person. And I thank God for his life because the whole drama happened in America and two hospitals involved. His friend, a cardiologist involved. But thank God, Christians were praying. And uh, tonight we have with us a gentleman by the name Julian Sotoli. Good evening and welcome to the program, sir. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for having me. Praise God. God bless you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, we know we have a lot, you have a lot to share with us. So we're going to really right. allow you, you know, free flow. You know, I, I call it freestyle so that we don't hinder your thought or anything so that you can download whatever you want. Uh, but first of all, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Because, you know, sometimes when people say they've been to heaven and you look at the guys, they look strange. They don't, they don't have a decent job, they, they're not, you know, they, they look strange and weird. So you, you wonder, is it true? But in your case, you know, who are you? So, so I was born in Ghana and I grew up in Ghana. I did my, um, my primary and secondary school in Ghana and then moved to the U.S. where I did my undergrad, chemical engineering, and then my master's at Georgetown University, my MBA. Um, you know, I currently live here in the, in the U.S. and, um, you know, I'm married with two beautiful boys, okay. um, you know, and um, I work for IBM, you know, I'm a senior consultant, you know, here at, in, in, the, in Washington, D.C. with IBM. Okay. Um, so in a nutshell, that's basically... Okay, that, uh, that just uh, proves that you're not one of those... Stuff. Strange UFO guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before your encounter, your heavenly encounter, would you would you describe yourself as a maybe deeply religious Christian? What was your spiritual life like? You know, I'll call myself that I was very lukewarm. Mm. If, if, you know, that's what I'll call. So, you know, my 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 wife is. Um, she is very consistent, you know, and, you know, she's a very prayerful woman, you know, and she made sure that we, you know, right from the beginning, she wanted to, to um, bring the, the kids up in church. Okay. So that was something that we talked to, we talked about even before, you know, we had our two lovely boys, you know, so church was something that she made sure that we, we went to every, um, what's it called, every um, Sunday, mm -hmm. you know. But left to me, when I missed church, it wasn't a big deal, you know. Um, 
You know, the funny thing is, you know, I think I was still, I was seeking some way, somehow, still seeking, because I knew there was God, mm. you know, um, but I still had my doubts, you know, and a lot of things, you know. So, you know, I just went, I said, but I was not really a strong uh, uh, believer. But, but I was born again, though, I must say. Okay. You know, I gave my life to Christ so many years ago. So, okay. for that, I will say I did do that. Amen. Well, you know what? A lot of people would just like to hear what actually happened. But what I'd like you to do is lay the foundation as to how things were before you had this heart attack and before your departure and all the things. So we just allow you free flow to just explain things. Because I believe there are people with marital issues tonight who are watching because I know that played a very crucial role in, uh, in your encounter right. with the Lord. You, you're free to go ahead, sir. Right. So, you know, so when I came back and I looked at how everything played out, I realized that God was, this was really orchestrated by God because two weeks prior to my, uh, my cardiac arrest, um, I had a, I was in a very big argument with my wife, you know, to the point where, you know, we didn't speak for two weeks. You know, the way we communicated was through, uh, through WhatsApp. You know, that's how we communicated. Anything that had to do with the boys or dinner or anything was just um, through WhatsApp, you know. So, you know, to the point where, you know, we're actually thinking of um, going our separate ways. That was how, that's, it was that bad, mm. you know. Um, you know, not until the day or this August 17th mm. that um, I woke up in the morning with this severe chest pain. And, um, you know, it was very uncomfortable. So I got up and I came down to drink some water, hmm. you know, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm very health conscious. So, you know, I'm like, I, I, I normally don't drink even normal water. I, I drink alkaline water. I have an alkaline machine, you know, and I came down, took some alkaline, uh, alkaline water without thinking I put ice in it. Right. And that's something I never did, mm. you know, um, went back upstairs and um, went to lay down. But when I lay down, it was really bad. So I got up, I got up quickly. Within a minute, I got up, you know, but through all this, my wife said she was forcing herself to sleep because she didn't want to be the one to break that silence that we, we, we had. So she was forcing herself to sleep, not to speak to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I got back up and went to sit on a little futon right, right by the bed. But that's when she said she heard a voice that sounded like her mother who, who, uh, who passed away about 20 something years ago. Mm -hmm. And she, the, the sound was in uh, uh, the Ghanaian, a Ghanaian dialect called Fanti. You know, that, that uh, said to her, like basically stop what you're doing. There is something wrong, mm -hmm. you know. And then when she heard that, like she was fuming. So she just snapped at me and said, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And I gave it right back. <laughs> I got heartburns. Now, when I said hard burns, that's when she said, you know what, we're not going through this again. Because 10 years ago, I, I, went, I had a heart attack. But with that, I stayed home for almost 24 hours, even with the pain. But we didn't know what it was. And she thought it was hard burn, or I thought it was hard burn. So we just stayed home for, for a very long time until we went, until... Um, my friend, the cardiologist, was the one that insisted, sent his, his uh, chauffeur to pick me up and took me, brought me to meet with him and went to the, um, to the uh, hospital. And that one to a helicopter had to move me to another place to get it done. Hmm. You know, so the, that one was a much simpler process. Angioplasty went in and just opened the artery and then it was, it was done. I was still in the hospital for a couple of days. 
So once I said hard burn, she said to me, we're not going through this again. I'm calling 911. Mm -hmm. And I snapped right back at her and said, you're being too dramatic. We don't need 911. This is just a little chest pain. I'll, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But she knew that most likely when, when the paramedics come, I might not sit on the, get into the ambulance. Mm -hmm. So she, using the other phone, dialed, my uh, the cardiologist mm. dialed and called uh calling dr jamson called and said look julian is having heart burns he doesn't want to go to the uh, in, uh hospital but i've called 911 yeah, is is that okay he, she, he goes yes and then he dashed on so the the paramedics and the doctor arrived around the same time mm. you know and so when they came you know, they were, I was still walking fine. You know, the only thing is I was holding my chest, mm. you know, because very uncomfortable, you know. So I actually even walked to the ambulance, laid on the stretcher, and then they put me in there, you know. But they said there was definitely something wrong. So they thought they, were, they still wanted to take me in and just do a, a few tests, make sure I was okay, yeah. you know, and then see what the, the doctor says at the hospital, and then I'll come back home. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I went into the ambulance and they drove me to the hospital. And then my wife gathered my insurance information and all that good stuff and then followed the, uh, uh, the ambulance to the, to the hospital. Now, apparently when I left, my older son uh, um, saw everything happening, so he got very, uh, um, um, you know, got very scared. Mm. So as soon as the ambulance left, <clears throat> he runs to my younger son, Andrew, and says, um, uh, um, "Daddy is not feeling well." An ambulance just took Daddy to the hospital, mm. you know. And then the first thing that they did was they held hands and wow. started praying. Wow. And they were 12 and 13 at that point, mm -hmm. because growing up. My wife always taught them that they are never by themselves. When we take them to daycare, mm -hmm. but when daddy and mommy are not there, God is always with you. Yeah. You know, and if you have any concern, just talk to God. So yeah. I think that just came in and they immediately um, uh, held hands to pray. Mm. So they, they, they just kept praying and apparently they prayed for about an hour. Wow. You wow. know, because wow. at that point, they just needed God's um got uh, uh, assistant yeah. you know so we got to the hospital usually they pulled me into the into the uh, into one of the uh, rooms and uh, they started checking me out put a few things and i think they realized that there was i think there was there was a problem somewhere mm. so they told me that the cardiologist the hospital cardiologist was on on her way she should be there shortly you know and they asked if one or two questions and that was it i passed out I don't remember. So, I, I, you know, part of that's when, you know, uh, my heart stopped for the first time. So my heart stopped three times, you know. So when it stopped the first time, you know, they rushed me into the operating room. And, um, you know, my wife was, you know, basically before that happened, they, my wife asked the nurses, you know, we have two kids at home. You know, they'd be left at home by themselves. So they wanted, she, wanted, she wanted to know how things were going, you know, how long is it going to take so that, you know, we can go back. And the nurse said, oh, you know what, the, the cardiologist is coming to see him. He's, he should be fine. 20 minutes, you'll be out. She said she put her phone down. Within maybe 20 minutes, there was just a bunch of activities all over the place, you know. And uh, the, the doctors and nurses said, that's, her, that's his wife, that's his wife. So they came and said, you know what, your, your husband has had a, a, a cardiac arrest wow. and he's been rushed to the cath lab. Mm -hmm. so, they, so she got confused and, you know, they said uh, 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 he's flatlined. So wow. she immediately was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, so they held, they, you know, they kind of held her up. And while they're walking through the hallway, she says that she just saw a stretch just coming top speed and the, it had green and I think red lights on it, like siren or something that were rushing me to the cattle lab. And then somebody says, that's the white light, let, let her see him, let her see him. 
you know, so she said she just saw me laying on the thing, no movement, no nothing. That covered me all the way to the to the to, to my neck. And she said I'm really shrunken and my or oh, very pale. You know, um, you know, so so they moved it to the front of the um, 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 to the hospital, you know, then that's when she went into full game and started praying. Because, you know, you know first she called uh, and the, 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 uh, the cardiologist and said, look, I called you earlier on and said, oh, the doctor said, they said the nurse said 20 minutes, which, uh, you know, well, in about 20 minutes, we should be out of here. But this is what's going on. Julian uh, uh, fast flatlined and has been rushed to the catalog. So, so he dashes down, you know, he said, oh, he was, he was, he was, he was around not too far away, came in and managed to, um, to, uh, get, uh, what's it called, um, himself to the back where I was, you know, you know, so got there and he says he saw me laying down there lifeless body. And, um, you know how, you know, the monitor, you could just hear the beep. You know the, the the flat line beep, you know. So he stood there, and then this they shocked me the first time. Apparently, when they shocked me the first time, I came back, and then slipped away. So then they shocked me again, and then I came back. Now it was the third shock that I was gone for. They said over ten minutes. Hmm. You know, so when when my when they, my cardiologist came, the uh, the first two uh, flat line had already st- uh, 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 happened. So he came in when I was going through the ten minute uh, stretch. Yeah. You know, so he just saw my lifeless body. You know, just flopping around, and then you know after it, 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 this thing, and he could hear the flat line beep. You know, and he managed to get himself to the back. And, you know, he kept yelling, keep shocking him, he's going to come, keep shocking him. Because apparently in um, the state of Maryland, I think they normally, after maybe the sixth shock, you know, I think they normally call it if you don't, you know, if, if nothing happens. Yeah. You know, but for some reason, these doctors and nurses, those do the CPR, were determined to get me, get me up. So mm. they shocked me over 20 times. Wow. wow. It was, you know, after 20, they said they stopped counting. It could maybe 25 times, or but they kept shocking me. So it, you know, and um, you know, so you know, my wife telling me what was going on during that time was, you know, was, um, you know, uh, she was just on the floor and just asking God that mm-hmm. you can't do this, mm-hmm. and she kept praying, saying you can't do this to the boys, mm-hmm. because when she was pregnant. Before she had the two boys, she just gave the boys to dedicated the kids to God and said, "God, wow. these are your boys. Yeah. I'm just wow. here to take care of them. So these are your boys." So she's always said that right from bed. So her prayer was, "You can't do this to the boys. Yeah. You know, these are your boys. You can't take their father away." <laughs> you know, so she kept praying and she just kept, you know, yelling, "Have mercy." Have mercy on Andrew. Have mercy on Andrew. And she just kept repeating that. Have mercy on Andrew. Have mercy on Andrew. Have mercy on Matthew. Have mercy on Matthew. She just kept repeating that. Mm-hmm. You know. Now my cardiologist said at that point, she he knew based on his experience having you know uh, practiced medicine for all these years. At this point, he's never seen anybody come back. Wow. So he knew that there was. I mean, there was almost no hope. The only hope he had was prayer hmm. so you saw this cardiologist on his knees wow praying hmm. you know on his knees praying he just kept praying and praying and praying so after the 10 minutes um i hear um you know then they then i came back and then they had the beep 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 so he yelled and said to my wife, he's back, he's back, he's back, he's wow. back, you know. So now, whilst all this chaos was going on on earth, I came out of my body. I came out of my body so I could see my body on the operating table. Mm. Now, to be honest, I was very confused, you know, because the funny thing is I saw my body on the table 
you know, my, my, my entire big body on the table. But the nurses and doctors in the room were very tiny. You know, it's, it looked just like when you're on an aeroplane and you look down uh, 30,000 feet and you see the homes and everything, the cars, everything very little, yeah. very similar to that. You know, I got very confused, but it wasn't an attractive place to be. The earth was very dark, hmm. so it wasn't appealing. I didn't want to come back because the, let's say the, the peacefulness, the love and the beauty of where I was, I, I didn't want to be in that darkness, you know. So I started moving away. Now, mind you, when I came out of my body, the funny thing is, I never thought of my bank account. I never thought of my wife. I never thought of my kids. Oh. Everything about the air was pretty much washed away. I never, I never thought of anything. It was more looking down, and I, I, it wasn't an appealing place, so I was just moving towards this beautiful bright light, you know, beautiful light in more like a frame, you know, so the light is within, you can see the light within the frame, you know, and I believe, you know, that's what in the Bible, they, when they talk about heaven's gate, I believe that's what that is, because where I was, you know, if I should describe it, it was, it was more of a waiting place. That is how I, you know, I see beautiful greenery, you know, but it was um, uh, it was like a huge law, right? But at the same time, it looked like a waiting place that is enclosed. Very, very. Uh, it's very difficult to explain it, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. You know, uh, but I started moving away towards the beautiful light. That I mean, the way it is. I mean, you're just going to be drawn towards it. So I was going there, and then halfway, that was when God came, right? Now, nobody was, I, there was no, I didn't see anybody. Nobody was there to introduce me, oh, that's God. I knew immediately that was God. You know, I knew immediately that was God. You know, so as soon as God came, there was this abundance and of love, you know, and I kind of, you know, and God was the same as me, but he was just a bigger version, you know, he was a bigger version, and I just, had, I just went right into him, you know. Now, from, from, from this point going, there are a lot of things I'm going to say that I'll have to use it in a human body, that's how I'll have to explain it, because there's no other way to explain, you know, yeah. because yeah. we don't have hands, a head, legs, and all this stuff. But so, you know, God kind of had me, but, you know, we don't have hands. So but I'm just going to use that for it to make sense to, um, to, 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 to the viewers, you know. Um, so God kind of had me. I was kind of inside, you know, and then he showed me love. So the first thing God showed me was just love. And then he said to me, and, and trust me, my wife asked me that, Julian, so how does that love feel like? You know, and I thought about it and I said to her, I said, it was amazing, something I've never experienced before, you know. So, but she wanted me to explain. So I said, the best way to explain for her to understand is I was there when she had her two boys and I saw the love and the happiness and everything when the, the, kid, the kids were put on her chest. I said, that same love that you, you had that day, okay, of, of, of the birth of your two boys, multiply that by one million. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of love I'm talking about. You know, and, and then, you know, and then God said to me that, and he always referred to me as son. He never called me Julian. And you know, I guess Julian was stuck with a body on earth. Yeah. You know, he, he, you know, he just said to me, son, this love 
that I'm showing you. That is the same love I have for the poor. Then he said the homeless. You know, he also mentioned the madman. And then the gay guy. You know, now, I normally, see, you know, of course, you know, I, so I just listened to him. And, um, you know, and the funny thing is, I never questioned anything God said. You know, whatever he said, that was it. You know, never questioned anything. Yeah. Because once I keep telling you that our conversation, you'd have, you'd have expected me to ask, what do you mean by this? Or what do you, you know, because at that particular point, it shouldn't have made sense to me, right? So once he said that, that is when, after he talked about the love, that is when I said, I said, God, forgive me of all my sins. Then I said, now this is the first time I, I, I thought of my wife and kids. And I said, God, if this is what you call death, give me one more chance to make things right with Priscilla, that's my wife, and my two boys, Matthew and Andrew. Then I said to him, I said, I said, I said God, I know you have a lot of work for me to do. Let me know, and I promise I'll get it done. After I said all those three things, then God said, Son, I anoint you. So the first thing he did was he anointed me, and then he said, son, I'm going to make you whole. Then he went ahead and said, son, you have a pure heart. Right? Then he said, all I want you to do is to spread your testimony. He went ahead and said, he said, your testimony is going to bring a lot of souls to him. And then he said that I don't want you to be a pastor. And he said, as a matter of fact, 90% of churches in the world is not present. Wow. Churches are a business. Wow. Right? Wow. You know, then he said to me, he said, son, if you choose to spread your testimony through writing a book or, um, or a movie, all the proceeds needs to be given to the poor. He says, I don't want you to benefit not a red cent out of your testimony. Everything about your testimony needs to go to the poor. You know? Mm -hmm. So once he said that, then he said that, um, so I asked him, I said to him that, is, is the earth hell? And then once you die, you go to heaven. Right? Because to me, the earth was so dark. Once I came out, I saw this beautiful, and I knew that was heaven. You know, I was going to heaven, so I thought that was it. And then he said to me, he says, son, you will never know what hell looks like, but that wasn't your path. Mm -hmm. You know? He also made me aware that I'm not the only one working for him or, you know, doing an assignment for him. You know, he said he wants to come, but he's not going to come until every single soul on earth has heard about him. Wow. You know, and he, have, he has people just like me in remote areas spreading his word, you know, and then he, he said a couple of things, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know about you know me being the devil's, 
you know, that the devil is going to really come after me because of the number of souls I'm going to bring to me. I'm going to be a very powerful uh, tool. But, um, you know, so he told me how the devil was going to come in different cunning ways. So I should be careful. He gave me, gave me a few examples and stuff like that. And then after that, like a big force, I went back into my body. Wow. Mm. Went back into my body. And um, uh, what's it called? Um, you know, got back into my body. Um, I don't remember anything after that. Yeah. The only thing that I remember was, and I'm not sure which of the hospital had that, but a nurse came up to me and opened my eye and said, who is this? He has glycoma. You know, you know, so that, that was the only thing I remember. And then that was it, mm-hmm. you know, and then, um, you know, and then my wife, uh, uh, what was the call when I, you know, after surgery, when I came and, and had her praying for me until I woke up. But before then, based on what my wife and the cardiologist told me, is once I came back to my body, then the cardiologist um, and came to explain that, look, now he's back. So now the real work begins. Now they have to try and open the artery. Okay, so, you know, they went in for one hour and they tried and tried and they couldn't open it. They couldn't open it. They tried, you know, so they managed to open a very tiny, but they said that, you know, just to get a little bit of flow of blood, because mind you, for over 10 minutes, there hasn't been a flow of blood to my, to an oxygen to my brain, right? So that was a very crucial um, you know, so apparently, you know, from what I hear, you know, after three or four minutes, if there's no flow of blood and oxygen to your brain, you're going to be brain dead. You know, that's what, you know, I was told and also read, you know. So they said that they came back after an hour and said, look, we cannot open this. So we're going to have to airlift him to John Hopkins because they are more equipped you know, to be able to uh, uh, take it from here because they are not equipped to be able to open the artery and all the things that they need to do. So they're going to airlift me. So my wife says, okay. So they brought her a bunch of papers. So she signed everything. Once she finishes, okay, they come after a few minutes and they, they said the pilot says, he can't fly. The weather, they said, this cloud or this storm or this, you know, the weather was bad. You know, so they couldn't fly. So she's looking and said, God, what is this? Like, it was one obstacle after the other, Mm -hmm. you know. And I I forgot to actually mention that the, in, 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 when, when I flatlined the third time, when I was going for 10 minutes, the the hospital actually called the hospital chaplain to come because they knew it was just a matter of time. They were about to call it. Right. So the chaplain actually came to console, you know, my wife, the cardiologist and everybody. So, you know, um, so anyway, so can I ask people, what is it, obstacle after obstacle, you know, so they said they were going to have to transport me via ambulance, you know, and um, so now the stack of papers became even more because now the chances of my survival was very slim. You know, because to airlift me, we're talking about five minutes, right? Now, to take me by ambulance on a very uh, 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 non-traffic, uh, uh, this is about maybe 45 minutes, but with traffic, if there's no traffic, 45 minutes, there's traffic maybe an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. So it, it makes things even more complicated. You know, and, and also, they couldn't just put me on any type of ambulance because now I'm with all these gadgets, you know, life support machines and all these machines you can think of, you know. So, you know, they need, and they also needed specialized actual doctors on the ambulance, you know, in case of anything, they'll be right there to, to assist, you know. 
you know, so my wife, my wife and the cardiologist and his wife also gets to, um, to John Hopkins. And I, I didn't, I didn't arrive to maybe over two hours. I think, they, I think they said about two, two and a half hours before I got to Hopkins, you know, and I got to Hopkins, you know, and, you know, the doctors came and was, they were actually, what, I mean, were, they were shocked. Why did Howell General Hospital bring me here? Because apparently my organs are all shut down. Right. So well, hang, hang on. The uh, the um, the chaplain did did the chaplain come at John Hopkins or at the other hospital? It came at uh, the uh, the first hospital. Yeah, but you said there was something that uh, God spoke to your wife about when the chaplain appeared. Mm. Right. So so what happened was when the chaplain was coming, you know, there was this thought that came to her that said to her don't touch her because once you because she was she came with open arms to console mm -hmm. and said don't don't uh, touch her because once you do that you are accepting you are basically, uh, basically accepting the um what's it called um whatever uh, situation is going on, you're basically accepting it yeah. as that is final, okay. you know. So she just yelled at the nurse, and she said the nurse was, uh, sorry, the uh, chaplain was beautiful, I mean, like a very nice person. Yeah. She was actually sincerely came out to just comfort her, you know, but she says, no, don't touch me. Wow. Do wow. not touch me. Don't touch me. And then she goes, no, no, I'm not going to touch you. You know, and then that's when they moved her closer to where I was. Because it's at this point, you know, I, I believe that they were about to call it. Okay. You know, so they needed her there. Mm. You know, so yeah. that once they call the dead, at least there's a chaplain there to console yeah. and, uh, you know, comfort her. So now at John Hopkins. So now I get to John Hopkins. Now... After two and a half hours, I get there, and you know when they when they read my chat, this guy has flatlined uh, three times, goes gone for over ten minutes. There's no blood and oxygen to the brain, you know. His organs have all shut down, you know. Um, what what do they think we can do that they can do? do basically, <laughs> that was what you know wow. the surgeon came, you know, but. You know, they said they can, they can, they'll see what they can do, but there are three things that they could do. The first one was basically with maybe new, uh, uh, more, more uh, 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 sophisticated gadgets, maybe try and open the artery, what they were doing there first. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, then they will use a stent or try and open it with a stent or something, put a stent in there, you know. And then the final one, the third one was then uh, you'll have to do an open heart surgery. But that was something they didn't want to get there because based on what I had, my body had been through at the first uh, hospital, there was no way I could go through an open heart surgery. The wow. body wouldn't be able to handle that. You know, so, so uh, what's it called? Um, they went to do the first one. They came after about maybe another hour, hour and a half. They came back and said that didn't work. So they were going to do the God. second one. So they went to do the second one. So, you know, and, and my, my wife, after everything, she looks at the cardiologist and says, you know, ex, you know, is everything okay? You know, what does he think? And he says, oh, no, no, what they're doing is what he would do. So that's perfect. So the second, but he says, well, what if that doesn't happen? He said, oh, sure it's going to happen. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You know, so, he go, he, so um, they came back and said it didn't work. So they're going on the second option. So they go, they go to go do it. And then my wife asks the Dr. Jamsin, what happens if that doesn't work? She says, don't even think about that because we don't want to get there. Hmm. So this is going to happen. This is going to work. So she goes, okay. So another hour, hour and a half, they come back again and say, that didn't work. The only option now is to do an open heart surgery. But 
they don't, I mean, that's the, so my, you know, that's the only thing, I mean, that by now, that's the only last option. But even with that, they wouldn't advise it because, you know, look at it this way. One, even if we do it, there's a possibility, a very high possibility that he's going to come back brain dead because being, being you, uh, for your heart to uh, through a flat line for more than 10 minutes, most likely, you know, yeah, he's going to be brain dead. So, you know, and then, you know, she's going to have to take care of somebody who is like brain person. dead and I'm going to be, the quality of life will be so bad. So they were basically telling her that, you know what, you've got to very, weigh your options very well, you know, because we are going to just, basically they were just telling her everything. So for her to make her decision, you know, so my, my wife was just quiet. So she looks at the cardiologist to just get confirmation from him, Dr. Jamson. And he had turned away, Oops. you know, looking away with the wife consoling cry. So, so she, at this point, has nobody mm -hmm. else to, you know, get another opinion. So she just gets this uh, 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 feeling, you know, or thought that said to her that this person in front of you is going to be my puppet. Let him go inside because I'm going to do the surgery, <laughs> you know? So she just, she, she got this confidence. She says, go and do it. You know, and at this point, the surgeon was looking ahead, you know, thinking that, are you serious? You, why would you want to bring somebody? What, this guy is going to come back and live such a horrible life. Why do you want to do that? You know, but she made that decision based on what she had thought and what, how she felt at that particular time you know, made a decision, you know, and the cardiologist was like looking at her, like, like, you know, he, she, he was actually shocked, but he was happy. He didn't have to make it, make that decision because with his medical, with his medical um, training, most likely he would have said is better off pulling the plug because why I would have, really come back very upset because I'm, 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 you know, I've lived a very horrible life, you know, but she, he didn't want to have to say, pull the plug, you know, wanted her to make that decision. And she said, go and do it. And he was telling me that the confidence that she had that particular minute was amazing. I mean, he says he's never seen that, you know, so they went into the waiting room, but she was telling me that when she went back into the waiting room, when they, she said, go ahead and do it, at that point, once she got in there, she started feeling that doubt, like there was some doubt on her, you know, that wrong decision, or she felt very, very, she felt very down. And at that very minute, you know, she had two of her very good friends there, and then the third one just walked in at that time. So said, what's going on? And so she started telling her with a very low spirit, saying that this is what the doctors say. She's now, you know, she was, but this is what he, she said because of her feeling. And then this lady just said to her, are you going to listen to God or are you going to listen to man? man. And then she just burst out into singing and said, she started singing a song, a miracle working God, something like that, you know, singing, singing a miracle working God song. And she, she, you know, so she, and apparently then now she also starts singing. The cardiologist's wife starts singing, the cardiologist starts singing, you know, <laughs> and it's all starts singing in the room, you know, and, also, and there are a whole bunch of people in the, waiting for their loved ones and they're just watching it. But apparently it was so beautiful because the the nurse at the reception later on told her how beautiful 
that the song sounded, wow. you know, and they just kept praising God at that point. Hmm. And then they, they, they said, oh, this is going to be a very long surgery. You know, I think we're looking at about maybe six to eight hours, you know, uh, surgery. Hmm. So she should go back home and then they should be done at 10 at night, you know, uh, 10 o'clock. This was about maybe almost four o'clock, I think she said, you know, so she should go home. So by 10, they'll be done, you know, but, you know, the, the senior also said that this surgery most likely I'll pass on on the table. So, you know, the, she, she, he had to throw all the options out there for her to know because they had shocked me over uh, 20 times. 20 times. Yeah. They had done CPR, and apparently, with CPR, people break their ribs and stuff, you know, and, you know, they do a lot of, you know, you know when they do the CPR. So, they said, with everything my body has been through, they tried to open the army, gone in. You know, a whole bunch, they just been too much, you know. So, you know, so they made her win. Most likely, I'll, I'll pass on. So, you know, so she knows, so she knew, you know. So anyway, so she left. She went straight home and decided, you know what, she hasn't seen the kids all day. So, and the kids kept, how is daddy, how is daddy, you know. And he goes, oh, you know, he, he, uh, um, um, what's it called, uh, he's going to have surgery, you know, but God has this, so we sh they shouldn't worry, it's going to be fine, you know. And as soon as she says, God is in control, the kids said, that at that point, they knew everything was fine. Once she said that, she was, they, were, they went to a restaurant to go and eat. Wow. <laughs> you know, so she's trying to distract them. As soon as the food comes, so this was our maybe almost two hours, right? She gets a call. From John Hopkins. Wow. So an eight hour surgery, they call you in two hours. Ooh. You know that, you know what? It's over. Because if you think, oh, there's, uh, you know, I was asking a few doctors, I don't think anybody has seen a surgery being done in two hours, an open heart surgery, you know. So anyway, so they called in two hours. So she says, man, you know what? So she tried to pick up, you, she rushed out, you know. Of the of the restaurant, and then she loses the call. You know, now the off the hospital administrator gave her card because um, 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 you know or gave his card, and because he, he didn't want her to have to call for an update because it's going to go through so many you know press one, press two, press three, all the stuff. So call me directly. But she left the card at home. So she tried calling, she wasn't getting through. So she just goes in, grabs all the food, they pack everything, put them in the car, and they dash home. At that point, my kids were, they were telling me that at that point, that's when they knew there was something different wrong because they've never seen their mother act like this and the speed she was driving. Mm. You know, so she gets home, takes the car, and calls the hospital, picks up. It goes, this is Priscilla, Julian's uh, uh, wife. Uh, uh. And then they, they, she goes, she goes, he's out. She goes, out, as in dead or out, as in what? He goes, no, he's out of surgery. Surgery went very well done. <laughs> Everything is done. <laughs> right? Uh... So she looks at the time and she's like, she's, it was about seven. You know, and um, she looks at it and go, man, so from four, because she got a call about six something, you know, so definitely that already uh, finished the same, removed me to ICU. So, you know, two hours, you're already done. You know, so she rushed. So she called the cardiologist and says, Julian is out of surgery, I'm on my way. And she, he goes, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I'm going to come and get you because he said the way she was talking, there was no way. You know, she was going, he was going to allow her to drive. <laughs> so, picked her up, and then they came to, uh, um, to the ice, to the hospital, and they allowed only her to come and see me. So she came in there. She says, "I was still very pale, very shrunken, laying out there with, 
got a, a gazillion tubes around all through my neck, my mouth, my all over the place, you know. But the good thing is that she could hear my heart was beat, was 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 was, was uh, 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 you know, she could feel my heart uh, uh, going. Yeah. So, so she she just came, but at that point I was in an induced coma. So you know, you know. So I, I, I she started praying but the funny thing is i could hear everything you know and i keep telling her every time that if she had said anything negative about me i'd have heard everything so <laughs> it's a good thing she did it <laughs> it's a good thing she did it you wow know? so she was she, so she just kept praying 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 you know i could hear and i wanted to you know open my eyes or touch her but i couldn't do anything my, my everything was you know, wow. was, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't lift a finger. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And I got very frustrated trying to move, but it wouldn't work. You know, but I had everything. She sang some um, favorite song like the days of Elijah. I love the <laughs> song. So she sang that to me. And she was just telling me that they, they can't wait to, um, to, uh, to have me back home. And she loves me and all that oh. good stuff. <laughs> You know. but, but Julian, I want to ask you a question because we've just got a few minutes left. You talked okay. about, you asked God, we've got three minutes. We've, you asked God about grace. What did God right. teach you about grace? Well, what, what I uh, uh, um, um, got about grace was, one, everything bad that a human being could do, I did it before my death, right? But... God still called me having a pure heart. Wow. <laughs> right? You know, you know, so, you know, so it was, you know, so he didn't necessarily have say, talk about grace, but everything that happened was grace. Mm. Because the, the, I didn't deserve yeah. to yeah. be going to, to heaven. Yeah. I mean, to the point I was even fighting with my wife before. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't speak to her until my death, hmm. and it, even the little that I spoke to her was very harsh. Was it? Was it? Wasn't loving at all. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. So, um, you know. So that 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 that, that was grace. Mm. You Amen. Know, that, that was, that was you, grace. You know what? You know. We we we're going to suspend the operation there because I know you're coming back next week. Then you can now give us uh, more uh, mm -hmm. of what happened after. Because we know with the open heart surgery, they had to use a saw to cut through your uh, ribs mm. to get through to the heart. Chest. And chest. Through chest. the chest, sorry. To you know, get through the heart. And after that, a lot of patients go through serious pain. But somehow, yeah. because God used that surgeon as a puppet, your case was different. Yes. So I want to hold fire there. Next week, mm -hmm. we're going to see you and your wife. And then she'll be able to explain to us what she was uh, going through, what was happening behind the scene whilst you were having a great time in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Oh, absolutely. Geez. Absolutely. Absolutely. Julian, God has been great. God has been so good. Yes, it's been really captivating, and I'm sure all our viewers have also been captivated. Thank you so much for, for a great um, you know, ex testimony, and um, we can't wait to hear the rest of it next week. God bless you, Julian. I'll hand you over thank to you. So much. Thank you. Yes, we really thank God for your life, and I just, you know, and I know that uh, you you said something which was interesting, which I will talk about next week. When the Lord said He has, He loves the poor, He loves the sick, the madman, and even the homosexual, and apparently it was because you were homophobic before you went. That is correct. Okay, you next know, week. He wanted to know how much he loves everybody. Amen. Next week, <laughs> we'll take it off from there. God bless you and thank you so thank much you. for this wonderful time. And I really thank God for your life. Very encouraging and we're all truly blessed. Yes, thank Amen. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. God bless Amen. you. Amen. God bless you. Well, on that note, we want to thank you all for the fellowship tonight. You know what? Next week, we'll look, we're looking forward to you sending in your questions, things you want to ask him about, about heaven, about God, about what's go, you know, what went on. Please, get set and tell as many people as possible, especially the unbeliever next week to watch, because the wife would be with us. 
with him as well. Thank you so much. And whatever you do, don't touch that dial. Bye for now.